have a, I have a few slides just for the meetup, just to you know to talk through the meetup, and for those who um, uh, are new to EV8, there are just a few things that I want to go over with. I don't want to go into detail too much into detail into that because that's of course something that's done in the past. Normally, I also was numbering the meetups, but my um, my colleague uh, uh, Lara, who took over the meetups, unfortunately couldn't make it today. So I have absolutely no idea where we are number wise. So I just call it the uh, the meetup. And as you might have seen, is that um, uh, we're now releasing more and more into EV8, and we try to schedule a meetup every now and then to share these uh, these updates with you. Um, these videos also will be placed on uh, YouTube, so if you want to see something back, you can do that as well. So let's quickly start why we why we are here. So I also I always would like to go back to reiterate the problem that we try to solve and and um, uh, and what what we aim to do. So um, uh, we feel is a is a is a vector search engine, and um, uh, a nice way to to um, to understand the concept is yeah is based on the, the way that the data is represented. So for example, um, uh, this type of, of of wine, and if you use a traditional search engine and you would search for wine for uh, for seafood, it wouldn't match with something that would be good with fish because it wouldn't necessarily make that relation between. Um, uh, seafood and fish. Um, but what you can do actually with the, with the vector search engine, and we'll we'll go through that in in the examples and and, and the vectorization how that works. Um, you can actually find these uh, these answers because the uh, rather than doing a keyword match based on in this case wine or for seafood, you do a similarity search. So you search in a, in a vector space for something that is related to wine for seafood. So now you can find different data objects and you can relate uh, uh, a data object different. And that is the, it's at the core, the, 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 that's the core use case for VV8 and what VV8 tries to solve. Um, you can of course already do that with, with machine learning models, but the power of VV8 sits in the fact that it's a database, a data engine. So if you would have thousands or hundreds of thousands of millions of wines, for example, in your database, and you want to quickly search through them, that's the reason why you would work with Weave 8. Although we're also getting feedback from people saying that they just find the ease of use handy because it's just, you know, as you will see in a bit, uh, it's it, it's easy to, to, to get up and running. So the, the core idea came actually from uh, from Google, from Google search. So, all right, so the, the question that we wanted to answer was like, okay, if we ask these kind of types of questions on Google search um, uh, in the form of an abstract question and uh, the answer that is generating, how was it able to find that answer? Um, how, uh, how would you be able to do that on your own data and how can you do this as fast you know, as possible? So this was more the, the overarching goal that we had. Can we make something um, uh, can we make a, a search engine that people can use themselves on their own data, regardless what if what you know what kind of data you have or what kind of project that you're that you're running? But this was like the core idea. Can we can we build something similar? Um, so as so as I just mentioned, so how can you do that in an easy, fast, secure, and scalable way? And what we mean with easy in this context is that we strongly believe in the uh, in the UX element of of these kinds of technologies because in the end. If you are deep in in in, in these kinds of, of of technologies, then then you probably understand a lot what's happening. But we actually notice that there are a lot of people that they need to build something, they need to have a solution fast that needs to be easy for them to get up and running, and it needs easy um, it needs to be easy for them to add data, search for data, and and those kind of things. Um, fast, I guess, uh, speaks for itself, huh? so that the um, uh, it's nice if you can um, uh, get to these kind of results. Uh, but if it takes a few seconds to get to an answer, that's very unfortunate. So the other day, uh, somebody showed me a demo um, of something they built, and they were looking to evaluate, and they were able to solve the problem. But it took up to five to six seconds to actually uh, generate a response. What we mean with secure <clears throat> in this context is that Weavet is not a, um, a SaaS service. I mean, it exists as a SaaS service, but it's also the package is just, or the, the software is just available at, through an open source core. So you can run it from uh, wherever you want. And I and I can assume that scalable speaks for itself. Um, so we've hit as cloud native, or as one of my 
uh, colleagues like to um, always like to say it's uh, it's Kubernetes Kubernetes native. So that basically means that the um, what we need at the lowest level is Kubernetes, and that nowadays almost runs everywhere. Um, maybe one of our most important uh, USPs, if you will, in Weave 8 is the fact that it's modular. That's something we're going to look at also today. Um, so uh, the version one release early this year uh, made Weave 8 not only uh, completely standalone but also modular, and that means it becomes very easy for us to to add plug and playable modules to to Weave 8. So regardless of what these what these modules do, right? So they can, for example, they can vectorize data, but they can also add functionality to Weave 8 or those kind of things, and it's very easy to integrate in the in the Weave 8 ecosystem. Um, we have a focus on on real time or near real time, if you will. Uh, so my my colleague Chen, I believe, is also on the call. He um, wrote a nice article on towards data science about that that we are able to get to sub fifty milliseconds results. And last but not least, and uh, Weave is, is a vector search engine. And what's important to say here is that um, one of the goals that we have with Weave is not to only be able to store vectors and quickly search through vectors, but also to store the data object itself. So our our oh, somebody wants to join. Now I have to click the accept link. Uh, oh, and they're gone. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so our goal is. Um, uh, uh, not to only store the vectors and search for them, but more also store the data object that somebody really gets the feeling that they're dealing with a uh, with a, a, a normal database like what they're used to, but that they get all these additional features that we can uh, do based on the on similarity searches and the, and, the, and the classifications. Um, and as we like to say, it's built to scale your machine learning models. And what we mean with that is that if you um, let's say you use a um, well, a transformer model, for example, that we're going to look at today. Um, uh, it's great to use that on a document or to get inside of documents or a handful of documents. Um, however, if you want to scale that to, to thousands or, or hundred thousands or even more documents, that's difficult, that's hard. And uh, as I like to say, it's like um, uh, nobody nowadays builds a, a database anymore, right? If you have an application, I mean, it's not, you're not also going to build, you know, your own database. You pick something off the shelf that you know that 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 fits your needs, and uh, we believe that we it will um, well you know will serve in a new need, and that is like or storing data uh, that gets vectorized by machine learning models, or um, uh, uh, searching through your own vectors, or however you want to do that, however you want to want to structure them, and especially thanks to the to the machine learning boom. For those who don't know. A lot of models came uh, uh, available to actually vectorize content. So this, uh, so we're now going to look at text, but very soon you will also see that we will start to release modules related to images and those kind of things, and you can mix and and uh, and and match them. Um, so the two core features that we have in Weave Eight are, as we like to call this, search and and the classification. Those are on the highest level. <clears throat> so search basically means that you search for something in the vector space. And that's what we also will go through in the uh, in the demo. And classification is actually the other way around. So um, uh, we've it as a as a as a graph like data model. So that means if you have multiple objects in your in your um, in your graph, you can automatically make relations, uh, or ask we've it automatically make relations between certain um, uh, uh, nodes in your graph, if you will, or between data objects. Uh, so we have the modules, as I mentioned. Uh, so we have NLP models, modules, transform modules. You can also make custom modules. Um, and we'll go through that in a bit. Um, the goal is that it's completely end-to-end. -end, so it is a, a, a complete um, a solution for, for any industry, right? It's like a like you would use a normal database. You're agnostic about the, about the use case that you have. It's more the problem that you need to solve. And we have an open core. So that means that the core of VV8 is, is, uh, is open source. And the focus is on it being scalable and fast, and that's more UX uh, UX element. Um, um, one thing that I want to say about the um, uh, about the architecture, but maybe I don't know. HN, are you still on the call? Yes, 
yes, I you want to say a few words about, you want to say a few words about this because this is your core, um, you, you know, your day-to-day -day job. So maybe you want to say a few words about this. Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, on the architecture, so Bob mentioned something in the beginning that um, VV8 is not just about storing and searching vectors, but also about um, storing and searching the objects itself. And this is something that is reflected in our architecture uh, right in the in the core basically so we try to make sure that we store the data alongside uh, the vector positions and what that means is that sort of if you scale um, for example if you scale horizontally in a cluster that um, sort of on a single request you will always get uh, what you need sort of very nearby without having to make a lot of network requests for example so let's say you're searching for something like the um, the 10 related uh, 10 related wines and then you very quickly get 10 IDs back, but then you have to do 10 follow-up requests to resolve those IDs to objects, then these 10 follow-up requests could easily take more time than the, the search itself. And there in our architecture, we're making sure that sort of the, the vector index, which is the core, is stored alongside the object storage. And there's also an inverted index. So an inverted index essentially means for um, yeah, sort of the, the classic search case, the structured search case, um, which you can combine in VV8. So for example, if you have a query such as, give me uh, the wines related to, or that, that match well with fish, which have less than 12.5% alcohol or something. So this is something that's super structured and you could combine these and uh, sort of that's in the core of one chart. Um, yeah, then uh, if, we, if we vectorize data, this is a sort of, sort of a very simple, um, a very simple microservice pattern here. So in this case, VV8 itself runs entirely on CPUs. So that's cheap commodity hardware. Um, but these machine learning models typically require GPUs. So um, in this case, you can sort of split that out, scale it independently, and uh, just have your, your um, sort of cost intensive parts on, uh, on a separate machine. Okay, can we click to the next one? Yeah, one sec. Somebody's joining. Yep. <laughs> uh, oh, I, I don't have I don't have the next one. I only had this one in here. So oh, okay, I don't okay, cool, cool. I'm I'm gonna improvise the, the next one. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what you what you see right here is sort of the the current uh, state of the architecture and what we're currently working on um, is sort of turning VV8, which right now is confined to a single node, into a fully uh, distributed database. So right now. Um, we can easily cover uh, um, sort of data sets of one to 10 million, maybe even 100 million if you're okay with sort of, um, yeah, the, the machine running a bit slow here and there, slow in relative terms, so just meaning you can't get maximum performance. And um, what we're working on right now is basically making this horizontally scalable. And this is one of our key goals in the architecture. And that was always from the beginning. So if we, we always knew that we wouldn't do any kind of patterns that wouldn't lead to, or that wouldn't work with scalability. So um, yeah, sort of half a year from now, basically uh, VV8 is then a fully distributed database and you can scale sort of for whatever needs you have. So one of the typical examples would be high availability. So you just don't want your machine to go down um, because I don't know, it's maybe serving a user facing site. So you need high, high availability or maybe to get a higher throughput because you produce more data than a single VV8 machine could import in a day, for example, or all these kinds of, kinds of um, yeah, scaling use cases that you can configure to your needs. Cool. Thank you very much for sharing. So this is, as I, as I mentioned, this is my, my last slide because I, I want to get to more a, a show rather than tell um, a, a situation. Uh, but of course, I wanted to also give a little bit of, of, of context for you all. So um, what I always like to do is that I like to start from the perspective of our documentation, because the documentation is the, yeah, it's the heart where you start to learn uh, about VV8 and how you can, um, uh, how you can use it. Um, the um, uh, one big thing that has changed with um, uh, with the new setup is actually the, the installation pattern. So, as 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 we uh, as I mentioned earlier, like the goal for us is to make it as simple as possible for you to start working with all these models and all these out of the box setups. And and what we use at the lowest level is, or for the for the production environment, we talk about Kubernetes. But if you develop, you can just do that on with with Docker. So one new thing that we have uh, is the, um, the customizer. So if you just go to installation, you can customize your uh, your VV8 setup. So of course, I'm going to choose the latest version. 
Uh, here you already see the media types. So what's, um, uh, you, can set, you can select none. Uh, so if you only want to use WeVA to store vectors and search through vectors, but if you want to use specific um, uh, modules then um, uh, to vectorize, you can do that as well. What is interesting here is that you see your images coming soon. Uh, we will have more coming soon, but an interesting um, uh, thing that I already want to share with you is that in the future, we'll be able to mix them. So you will be able to say, well, this data object I want to vectorize based on its text, and this data object I want to uh, vectorize based on its uh, on, on the images for or the image that it represents, but you can still connect them in the same graph space, if you will. So I'm going to go for text uh, for now. Uh, we currently have two types. So the first one that we started with uh, was what we call the contextionary, which is based on glove and fast text. Uh, and now we also have the F transformers available. The, um, of course, if we're going to add in the future, we're going to add um, the images, then you will get even more, of course, modules uh, available. Um, just interesting to know is that one of the things that we learned from using it in practice is that if you have more classification use cases so that you have data that you want WeVia to classify uh, for you, then the contextionary works very well. Uh, so the, the uh, based on glove and fast text. And if you want to do more with text or if you want to search through text, then the, the transformers work better. So it depends a little bit on the use case that you have, but this is also something that you can play around with. So it's very easy to spin up one WeVia to the other and just you know play around with, um, um, oh, somebody else is joining, here we go, with, um, um, you, you can play around with these with these with these modules easily. Um, what's important to mention here as well, you just have to make minor tweaks, and I will talk about that in a bit to um, uh, to just shift between modules while you're developing and trying to figure out how to use with it. Uh, the last but not least, oh no, two more steps. So one of you 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 pick the model uh, that you want. So I'm just gonna go for the first in this case. Uh, this one, this is for enterprise users, which we don't need now, so it's disabled. And then you select your runtime. So you say like Docker Compose, and soon we also have Kubernetes. And what this outputs is a very nice one single curl command that contains a very long URL, as you can see, with exactly your um, um, your configuration. So if you would look, look just at that URL, you can see, see <clears throat> the configuration that we just made is represented in this Docker file. So now just running Docker Compose up is enough to um, uh, to start working with the uh, with the environment. The next a tiny tiny comment from my side. Yeah. Uh, sorry for the interruption. Uh, no, just no. on the Kubernetes part, um, the the part that's missing here is just uh, Kubernetes in the customizer. Um, so VV8 itself already works with Kubernetes. Just right now, you would have to sort of manually uh, adapt your your. We have a Helm chart, and you can adapt the values YAML. So you can use it on Kubernetes already, just not uh, configure it with the customizer. Cool. Thank you. Um, at the next step, um, um, the next thing that you need to do with WeVit is that WeVit has a schema, so, so a graph-like schema. Um, so we get a lot of questions about schema. So my colleague, Laura, is now also working on a few extra tutorials to understand um, the schema. But actually, the uh, using the schema, oh, somebody sent something here. Let's see. Uh, oh, thanks. We'll, we'll look at that. Um, Wolfgang, thank you. So the, um, uh, the schema, so Laura is working on a few tutorials also to learn how to work with the schemas, but the very simple concept is with the, with the schema is that you define the class property structure that WeVIAT has. So um, we spun up a WeVIAT already in the cloud just to, to give you a demo. So uh, WeVIAT is completely API based and I can explain the schema actually from that perspective. So the schema, this is a very simple uh, schema because it only contains one node. Uh, we don't make any graph relations here because we want to really focus on, on showing the, the, the model in action. But it does nicely show you how the, how the, the schema works. So all the schemas have a, uh, have a class. So they can have multiple classes. So I should let me increase it a little bit. They have multiple classes, hence it's an array. And then here you see, for example, the first class that is a paragraph. Um, a few things that I want to highlight here. The first thing is that you have a module config. So you need to explain which um, uh, 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 module you want to use to vectorize the data. And that has to do what I said in the past, like in the future, we will be you will be able to use different vectorizers for different um, uh, uh, classes. So now we have a class paragraph where we want to use the uh, text to vec uh, uh, module. 
but maybe in the future we'll also will have images that would be part of that paragraph. And then you would say, well, I have the image to VEC um, uh, module. Um, then, of course, we have properties because a class has properties. So in this case, this class has two types of properties. So one is the title, one is the content. And those are both, both text uh, objects. And here you can see we can even give more in-depth configurations for the schema. So in this case, we're saying that we do not want to vectorize the property name, for example. Something you can all learn on the website that's all in the documentation, but that you can see uh, how that schema is, is defined. And um, if we now go to the GraphQL interface that we use to query data, you will actually see this coming back. So if I now say uh, get, and I would say paragraph, so I start with the, from the perspective of the class, which always starts with, a, with a, a capitalized first character. And then here you see I have title and content. So these are paragraph, title, and content, which I use during querying. And these are defined here in the, um, uh, in the schema. Um, creating a schema, updating a schema, um, many ways how you can do that. You can do that directly through, through curl. So yeah, so you can just do API um, calls. But we have the Python, and we have Python libraries, we have J JavaScript library, Go library, and we have, a, I believe, a Java libraries in the making. Um, uh, so we will have more and more of these kinds of libraries available in the, in the future. So um, what I'm showing you today is completely through the API but you can make all the requests for all these libraries as well, if you like. Um, one thing that I want to do first is that I want to, before we start searching um, uh, with Weaviet, I want to look at the data objects. So one of the things that we can do in Weaviet is that, that we can say like, okay, show me just dump all the, all the, um, um, uh, dump all the, all the data that you have. So here you see, for example, we just have objects um, as you will see in a bit, we have about a million objects in here. So this is just the first object that it encounters. This object has an idea, it has content, and it has a, has a title. Uh, so what we can do is like we can take that idea and then go just one step deeper, and we can retrieve that, that node. This is, if you look at WeaveGate from a graph perspective, this is one uh, a node in your graph. So it is a node of the class paragraph, uh, a paragraph. It has a properties, content, and title. There are no references in here, so it's not referring to any other uh, nodes. This is just a very simple standalone node. Um, but what is interesting here is one of the things that we always say is that every data object in Revit is represented uh, by, 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 the, um, by a vector. So uh, these, these, these nodes are, if you will, they're floating around in space. And there's actually a way how we can uh, see that. So we can do uh, additional. Uh, and then it, uh, is uh, I, I'm doing this from the top of my head. Uh, not additional. It is uh, include. I think. Oh, include. Sorry, include. Sorry, yeah. Well, it's a, it's a demo, right? So sometimes stuff goes wrong. So it's not. It's not. It's include. So I can say, well, include the vector here. So now you see here. So this paragraph about Independence Day is represented by this vector, and we could do this for all the data objects that we have. And so this is also how you can how you can envision this. Um, uh, these these um, all these nodes are floating around in hyperspace, and the coordinates where they float around are are these represented in this in this vector. So if you now go to the GraphQL interface, so what we often say is um, you use the RESTful API to, or well, what I often say is like use the RESTful API to add data, and and the GraphQL API to retrieve data. Or if you use one of the client libraries, then you're basically under the hood. You're, that's what you're using. Um, but you can use the, the GraphQL um, uh, API to retrieve data. So if I now say, well, this query is very simple query. So this basically says, like, okay, get me all the paragraphs and show me the title and the content. Uh, so if I run this query, it just shows me random paragraphs um, uh, and their titles and their content. And as you can see, the first one here that returns is also Independence Day, which it's kind of, the query is kind of similar, right, to the one that I just showed via the RESTful endpoint. Um, oh, let me not forget to also show you um, how many uh, that we're dealing with. So what we have at the at the core is like we have we have uh, three root functions. So get, that's one that will, that's the one that we'll be using. We also have explore, 
Um, no. That's something we're just going to uh, pause for later. But we also have aggregate. And aggregate is actually used to, um, uh, you know, to get insights about, about your UEFA. So you can say, for example, uh, meta, and then I can say count. So what this query basically says, like, OK, aggregate all the paragraph information. Um, and the meta information is that I want to see is just that I want you to count all the uh, objects. So as you can see here, this results in just under a million uh, uh, Wikipedia paragraphs just so you know what the size is that we're dealing with during this demo. So let me get rid of this again. Let's go back to the, to the previous query. Oh. Um, one of the things where it becomes interesting is, of course, is that we say like, okay, we now we want, we want to leverage these vector representations. We want to do something with them. And so one of the things that we can do is that in, um, in this specific case and for this specific demo, we use the transformer um, uh, uh, um, uh, module and and what the, what the the transformer module is specifically good at is dealing with longer questions or those kind of things. So how we do that in Weaveate is that we use the near text um, uh, um, uh, function. Let me say we search for concepts and we can ask, um, for example, we can say uh, herbs used in the French kitchen. I believe if you have seen the video that I made, I use the same. I use the same query. I think uh, certainty. So let's say. Oh, let's not use the certainty yet. Let's search. Just start with the limit first, and let's say, for example, the first three results. So what this query says is like do the exact same as you just did before, but now uh, vectorize the query herbs used in the French kitchen. Take that vector representation of that query and search to the vector space what kind of data objects are the, the most closely related to, um, uh, to this query and show me the first three results. So if I now run this query, uh, you see we get back titles from, in this case, French cuisine. Um, um, and so we see here the, the herbs and seasonings and the French regional cuisine, etc. Now it's important to bear in mind here is that the lower, the further down the answer is, the further it's removed from our from our query, and there are two interesting things here to look at. So one is the uh, the order, and and the the reason that um, we've really got to this order is actually something you can see. So we can say we can add the certainty as an additional property. So what it shows here is like what the uh, so what it shows here is the. Um, uh, uh, the distance from the um, uh, from the query to the um, uh, to the result, and as you can see here, so this one French cuisine, it's a, it's close by because it's like it's set to eighty eight percent, and this is set to eighty four percent, so it's it's further removed um, uh, um, uh, from the from the query, and here it's even eighty one percent. So that means that if I would increase this number, so let me set it to five. That, that and the further I go down, you will see that the further, the lower the, the percentage um, uh, drops. Now, one of the things that you can do with Vivid as well is that if you want to use that in a for use case, then you might say, well, I don't necessarily want to limit it to five results, but I also want to set a, a, a minimal certainty. So you can say, well, I want to have a, a minimal certainty of, let's say, 85. So, and now run this query. It basically says, like, show me all the results uh, that are higher than 85% certainty. And if there are more than five um, results, then you know, then then limit those to to five. So if I now run this query, you see that it's um, uh, the answers returned in. Um, uh, there's just one answer uh, returned that you that you can use in your results, uh, and it still has that additional certainty here. So that is in a in a um, in a nutshell, who that, how that we it works. Um, uh, one of the things that we're currently also working on with these modules is that we say like we kind of move closer to, for example, a question answering. That it also goes into the content to try to find the answer in there as well. And oh yeah, the last thing that I forgot to mention that is very important. That is of course that's the speed that we're dealing with. So this server, I'm I'm running this demo from uh, from Amsterdam. This server is spun up in uh, in in the, in the center of the U.S. So the moment when I when I hit this um, um, uh, this search button, 
uh, the time that it took to, re um, uh, to send back the results based on the, th the million data objects. First, I had to travel to the US. We've yet had to process the data and it had to send it back. And based on our own benchmarks, we see that these, for this specific demo, it takes about 100 milliseconds to travel to the US, about 35 milliseconds to get, you know, to, to capture the results from VV8 and to send it back. So one of the things that you will notice that if you're building a solution um, uh, yourself and you run it locally or you're running um, your queries on the same machine um, uh, as where you're working on, then it will be uh, even, even faster. Um, so that's an important thing to mention um, uh, here as well. Um, let's see if there's something more that I want to say about this. Well, the only thing that I want to say about this, that's the, um, uh, uh, that we look very much forward to people uh, starting to work with these, with these, uh, with these uh, uh, vectorizer modules. I'm um, also curious if people are interested in custom modules. We are interested to learn if people, this is a little bit more uh, into the nitty gritty, but if people are interested in different uh, uh, index plugins, we are interested in learning if people need different client libraries, and we're interested in learning if people need different um, uh, CRUD operations for um, uh, working with, the, with your data. So coincidentally, somebody um, uh, created an issue today on, on our GitHub uh, asking for specific support. So we just look forward for people trying it out, work with it, and um, you know share with us their learnings and, and what they think that we can do better or where we can uh, uh, where we can improve. So that was what I wanted to show to you today. Uh, everything that I've shown you is something you can run yourself. So um, um, let's quickly. So uh, are you still on the call, uh, HM? Yep. Do you know by heart what um, uh, BERT model is being used for this um, for this demo? Uh, yeah, in, in this case, this is one of the sentence transformer models and the one uh, that is based on the Microsoft uh, data set, uh, I think it's called MS Marco. And essentially this particular, so, so they call it asymmetric uh, um, uh, semantic search. So that means that particular model is trained on matching short queries and question queries to potentially long answers. So it was trained on, I think, Bing search queries uh, just from, from usage data, knowing that, I don't know, users who ask, like, who is the CEO of Google or something? And then if they don't click on the first result, but on the second result, and that's like a usage metrics uh, metric that tells the model um, that this is a potentially a better result. And it was trained on, on these kind of, um, yeah, on, on these kind of data sets. Yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks for mentioning. So, 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 um, uh, where I wanted to get to side, so it's very easy for you to to get this same setup up and running. Important thing to mention: I am aware that uh, that there are people on this uh, on this call who are also interested in maybe working with their own transformer models. Uh, what you can do there, and I'm going here from the top of my head. So, if you go to the uh, the, the modules, the text to vec modules, you can go to the option custom built with a private or local model. And there's explained how you can build your own private or local model. The only difference there is that what you've seen in the configurator is a setup where we um, uh, uh, takes everything from Docker Hub just out of the box. You literally only run Docker Compose up and, and you're good to go. So we have it runs. Uh, here you need to take that one extra step where you need to build that, um, uh, that module yourself with the, with the um, uh, transformer module that you want to use. Also, if you will be using that, this somebody joining again. Yeah. So also, if you um, um, if you want if you're working with that, we also would love to learn what your experience is. If it's easy enough for you to use, uh, I think that here the the importance sits more in the um, um, uh, in the documentation rather than in the software. And what I mean with that is that if the if you know if it's clear for you how to go. Uh, how to make the changes uh, from a documentation point of view, um, then it runs because using all our tests and and also for certain um, customers we use these custom models. So um, uh, and we know that it works, but we also would love to get feedback from people just try it out directly from the perspective of the of the documentation. So that leads me to also looking at the time because I've been speaking way too long. So to um, uh, also stop the uh, stop the recording and ask you,